Hey, I'm James, and today I'm going to discuss the uterus. I'll start by going over the structures that make up the uterus, the associated ligaments, and related viscera. I will then move on to arterial supply and venous drainage. Finally, I will discuss the relationship between the blood supply and the ureter, and its implications for hysterectomy. Make sure to subscribe to be the first to know when we release new videos. The term uterus gets thrown around a lot, yet most are confused as to what structures actually make up the uterus. The uterus consists of the uterine corpus, which is located here, and most distally, the uterine cervix. The uterine corpus is described as having a fundus, located in the proximal region here, and a body, located here. Some textbooks will also describe an isthmic portion, located here, where the uterine cavity narrows as it approaches the cervical canal. The cervix has two openings, a proximal opening here, referred to as the internal cervical os, and a distal opening, which is the external cervical os, which allows for communication between the uterine cavity, the cervical canal, and the vagina, which isn't included on this model. The uterus is described as having three layers, an inner endometrium, which lines the uterine cavity. This is a highly vascular glandular layer that is subject to great change throughout the menstrual cycle. The myometrium is this middle layer here. It is primarily muscular tissue with a small proportion of fibrous tissue. The outer layer is named the perimetrium, which is formed by the overlying peritoneum. However, this is not included in this model at the moment. The structure of the cervix, located here, is slightly more complicated and is not typically described in anatomical texts. It is primarily a fibrous structure that acts as a sphincter during pregnancy. The uterine tubes extend from the lateral walls of the uterine corpus, as we can see here and here. They provide a connection between the uterine corpus and the ovaries located here and here although it's important to stress that there is no direct connection between the ovary and the uterine tube. Instead, fimbria, located at the most lateral ends of the uterine tube, sweep the ovum into the uterine tube. The female reproductive tract is therefore open because there is a direct connection between the outside world and the female abdominal cavity. This provides the roots for the spread of infection and a route for endometrial tissues to reach the abdominal cavity. As there is no direct connection between the ovary and the uterine tube, there is a chance that the ovum will not reach the tube. If fertilization occurs outside of the tube, it can result in an ectopic abdominal pregnancy. There are a number of ligaments that are associated with the uterus. The ovarian ligaments, which is located here, and the round ligaments, can be considered as one continuous cord that runs from the ovary to the corpus, to the labia majora. The round ligament leaves the pelvic cavity via a deep inguinal ring, traverses the inguinal canal, leaves through the superficial inguinal ring, and then inserts into the labia majora. The ovarian and round ligament are remnants of the gubernaculum, which is the embryonic cord-like structure that guides the gonads through the inguinal canal. Normally, descent of the gonads will only occur in males. The other ligament that can be considered at this point is the broad ligament. The uterus is a subperitoneal structure similar to that of the bladder and the rectum, and so the peritoneum, which we can see has been added here and here, drapes over the uterus. The peritoneum that drapes over the uterus forms the perimetrium, which is considered the external layer of the uterus, which we can see here. The peritoneum not attached to the uterus is the broad ligament. The broad ligament can be further subdivided in accordance with the structures it is associated with. So at the moment, we can see the peritoneum here and here. Can we refer to as the meso-ovarium and meso-salpinx respectively because they are associated with the ovary and the uterine tube? If we rotate the model, we can see the final part of the broad ligament, which we can refer to as the mesometrium, which is here. So from this point on, we are going to consider the visceral and structural relations of the uterus. On the screen, we can see the uterus has been hemisected, and the hemisected bladder and rectum have been added. 
So if we rotate the model around, we can see that the bladder is located anterior to the uterus and the rectum is located to the posterior of the uterus. The peritoneum has once again been added to the model and as we can see, it drapes over the pelvic viscera and so the pelvic viscera can be described as subperitoneal structures. Here, we can see the peritoneum overlying the round ligament of the uterus and here, the peritoneum is overlying the ovarian neurovascular bundle and consequently forming the suspensory ligament of the ovary. Pouches are also formed between the pelvic viscera. Anteriorly, between the bladder and the uterus, we have the uterovesical pouch. The space between the uterus and the rectum, posteriorly here, is known as the uterorectal pouch, or sometimes referred to as the pouch of Douglas. These pouches are within the peritoneal cavity and form a space in which free fluid can accumulate. The rectouterine pouch, located here, is the most inferior portion of the peritoneal cavity and is often the first place for free peritoneal fluid to accumulate. The collection of free fluid can be a consequence of physiological or pathological processes. Coldocentesis is the process of draining this fluid through the introduction of a spinal needle through the vaginal wall through the vaginal fornices, which we can see here. The fornices are formed due to the projection of the cervix which is here, into the vaginal cavity, which forms a continuous lateral recess around the outside of the cervix and the vaginal wall. The relationship between the vagina, cervix, and uterine corpus are described as a series of angles. These angles are relative to the long axes through the center of these structures. So as we rotate the model, we can see that the cervix here projects into the vagina here. So if we compare the long axes through the vagina and through the cervix, it will create an angle of antiversion. Similarly, as we compare the long axes through the cervix and the uterine corpus, it creates an angle of antiflexion. And this angle of antiflexion allows the uterine corpus to assume its natural position on the superior surface of the bladder here. However, the uterus can assume other positions within the pelvis due to alterations in the angles, such as retroversion and retroflexion, though these variations rarely have clinical implications. Various supporting structures within the pelvis are thought to assist in maintaining the angles of antiversion and antiflexion. These structures being the cardinal ligaments and the uterosacral ligaments. There is little agreement within the literature about the attachment of these ligaments, though in general, they are thought to be connective tissue structures that contain associated nerves and vessels that extend from the cervix to the sacrum, in the case of the uterosacral ligament, and from the cervix to the internal iliac vessels, as in the case of the cardinal ligaments. Blood supply and drainage of the pelvic viscera are from branches of the internal iliac artery and the internal iliac vein, which we can see here. However, the ovary is slightly different because the ovarian arteries arise directly from the aorta, these being the ovarian arteries here. And venous blood is drained via the ovarian veins, which on the right-hand side will drain into the IVC, and on the left-hand side will drain into the left renal vein. The uterine artery arises directly from the internal iliac artery. The vaginal artery, which we can see here, will sometimes arise from the uterine artery, although in some cases it will arise from the internal iliac artery. At the level of the cervix, the uterine artery will split to form the ascending branch, which will supply the corpus, the uterine tube, and sometimes the ovary, and a descending branch, which will supply the vagina. However, it is important to remember that great variation is often observed in this region of the body, and so it is important to trace the vessels in order to ascertain which structures they are supplying. An important relationship to remember is the position of the uterine artery relative to that of the ureter. At the approximate level of the ischial spine, the ureter will pass inferior to that of the uterine vessels, which can be easily remembered using the phrase, water passes under the bridge. The ureter is in danger of being clamped, ligated or transected during hysterectomy. The ureter is also vulnerable to injury during an oviorectomy as the ovarian vessels lie very close to that of the ureter 
as they cross over the pelvic brim. So just a quick summary. The uterus is a collective term referring to the uterine corpus and cervix. It is a subperitoneal structure as it lies inferior to the peritoneal cavity. Pouches are located both anterior and posterior to the uterus within the peritoneal cavity, which allow for the accumulation of free fluid. The uterus is supplied by the uterine artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery. The uterine artery is closely related to the ureter at the level of the ischial spines, so it is important to remember that the ureter passes inferior to the artery during hysterectomy. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought of this video and what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. You can do this by leaving a comment or dropping us an email.